Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast put on by three guys who work at a classical school. I, just, I need to figure out this intro one of these days. Oh. Today's not that day. Hey, uh, this is Thomas Magby, joined as always by AJ Hannenberg. That's me. And Graham Donaldson. Hi, hi. Well, listeners, as I'm hoping you all will not be surprised by, we are continuing uh, this series on the abolition of man. Uh, you've listened to parts one and two, hopefully, before coming to this episode. If you have not, please go back and listen to those. Today we're going to go into chapter four, right? One, two, four. Yeah, we're skipping yeah. three. Yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds like a the, good plan. The last of the chapters. <laughs> All right, chapter three of Abolition of Man. Uh, I think, Graham, you're taking this one away. That's right. So this is the last lecture that C.S. Lewis gave on this specific subject. It's, um, a, it's a small book. Don't be intimidated. Oh, yeah. It you is like 60 it. pages. I believe in you. For listening. anyone in Austin, if you have Hoopla, it's an hour and a half audio book. So, like, it's it's real short. Yeah. Do do that. yeah Why do you great. have to be in Austin? Uh, just be, So, like, it matters what city you're in for whether you have access. If your <laughs> library system has access to oh, Hoopla. Oh, never heard really? about that. Yep. That's oh, something yeah. I didn't know. I think uh, Driftwood doesn't have it. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Hoopla sounds like a three-on-three basketball tournament. Hoopla. Mm-hmm. That sounds like fun. Hoopla 1998. <laughs> yeah, and Driftwood fun. definitely sounds like a town in Texas. Yeah. Because it is. Yeah. Um, so the first two chapters, uh, the first one was Lewis was talking about a uh, uh, English textbook that he stumbled upon that was doing more than just teaching how to write and how to appreciate literature. It was um, positing a pretty uh, robust philosophy about how lots of, of values that we hold are subjective and that they're merely just statements about one's feeling of the person who is feeling it. And Lewis was uh, thinking about, well, what happens if we actually like take this philosophy and run with it? Uh, and then the second uh, uh, lecture that we uh, talked about last podcast was where Lewis was trying to give philosophical, a philosophical basis for not believing in an objective morality whether it could be done just by making arguments towards expediency or arguments towards instinct. And he, and in his, uh, Lewis rejected those two things saying that, no, um, if you want to have logic, if you want to have meaning in the world, you need to have a stick by which meaning is measured. Um, you need to have some kind of, uh, um, first principles, a priori axiomatic statements of value that you can use and then apply it to the situations you have in life to say that something is better or is not better. Um, the phrase we were talking about last podcast was you cannot go from the indicative to the imperative. You cannot go from this is happening to this ought not happen or this ought to happen. Um, and so An imperative has to be a premise. Yeah. So we spent a long time talking about that. So li- that last podcast was a lot, was dealing a lot more with, the philosophical basis and really fundamental logic. The last um, chapter that Lewis talks about is um, a uh, sort of a long thought process about the nature of science and technology and what mankind, what can happen if mankind has the ability to make future generations in its own image, in, in its own ideas to what they think human beings ought to be. So if they reject this, this traditional idea of the Tao that all civilizations have had a relationship with, if they reject that um, and they say, no, what mankind ought to be is X, Lewis uh, wants to sort of uh, take that, that idea seriously. And he starts off this by talking about the idea of man's quote-unquote conquest of nature. So, quick pause. He was doing this in the era of conditioning, where they thought that you could make kids listen to stuff in the womb and they would wake up conditioned a certain way, mm-hmm. right? And that is that is kind of the thing that he's tackling. Yeah, and, this and is the world of dealing. early eugenics. Eugenics, was, he talks mm-hmm. about that a lot, too. Yeah, so there's that, and I think it's <clears> really, really easy to take his entire conversation here and put it onto gene editing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, like, we are, this is still a pertinent conversation. It's not just that the eugenics question and the conditioning question, everything he says pretty much top to bottom can be directly transferred to that conversation. So it is still a relevant, pertinent conversation. Yeah. So the idea with eugenics, you know, for centuries, we have been uh, taking dogs and trying to make them into better dogs. Although all dogs are good dogs. Um, but we've <laughs> Who's been, a good boy? Who's a good boy? <laughs> but we've been, you know, for example, like they have bred certain kinds of dogs to do certain kinds of things. Like I do believe that pugs were bred to keep your feet warm. I, I kid <laughs> yes. you not. Yes. P- what? And then pugs were bred to not be very mobile and to want to stay near you so that, <laughs> and to want to sit on your feet. So they were for like rich ladies with cold feet. You get a pug. <laughs> wow. Dude. Now we've had some problems. Now I be- want one. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, you know, we've been breeding pugs in, and in a certain way that pugs, you know, have a hard time breathing, which is why they sound so adorable. Um, but anyway. So you get comedy and warm feet. Yeah. <laughs> but so this idea of like, you know, you can breed horses for certain kind of characteristics. Like you can go back in antiquity, or not antiquity, go back for, you know, for 200 years and see these books of horse breeders talking about selecting for traits. So this has been happening in human history for a long time in the animal kingdom, breeding specific horses to be able to do specific kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, the early 20th century, the, uh, this idea began to be applied to mankind. Wait a minute. Maybe all criminals are criminals because they all inherit some kind of traits that predispose them to criminality. Maybe we can, maybe we can figure out what that, those traits are. And through breeding, selective breeding, we can edit that out. Well, this becomes monstrous in, you know, Nazi Germany, who really uh, uh, um, puts this into practice. And let's not kid ourselves, it has been prevalent in lots of different civilizations, uh, England and the United States notwithstanding. Um, there have been these sort of early programs of eugenics and thinking about, can we build a better future um, by uh, selecting who makes it and who doesn't make it? Um, Anyway, so Lewis is, uh, is thinking about that, and he's thinking about the realm of technology, and he's thinking about the realm of this idea that man um, is conquering nature. Um, this idea that we can learn how nature works. So we learn how gravity and aerodynamics work. And because we do all of these sort of tests, and we can figure out more or less, if not completely how they work, at least how to manipulate it, we can now build airplanes. We can fly yeah. around. That's awesome. Um, we can figure out uh, the realm of radio waves and radio frequencies, and we can figure out how to make podcasts and send them to you all on the internet, right? Like this is because of technology and we scientific discovery and figuring out how things is um, uh, has given us the ability to have technology that gives us slightly more power over the natural world than previous generations. That's another podcast I really like, How Things Is. How Things Is. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a guy describing stuff in his house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My pug, so warm. <laughs> My feet are toasty. Um, <laughs> so and good. then Lewis says, and then there are you know, other technological advancements like and contraception. Um, we have been able to create things that can um, um, you know, keep the natural consequences of sex um, from happening, i.e. children, and that has a tremendous amount of, uh, of power over nature. But then sort of Lewis moves into saying, when we say power over nature, we also mean the power of some men over other men. So um, we mostly mean, yeah, the power of flight. Uh, we as human beings can now fly, but we also have companies that own airplanes and we pay to use them. Like and if all air if all airlines wanted to you know, keep us from flying. This is an argument that Lewis makes. It's kind of silly. Um, he's getting to the point about talking about contraceptives. Right. Um, like, with contraceptives, in a weird paradoxical way, this generation has a tremendous amount of say over what the next generation is going to be because we can root... Stop some, people, stop from some people from being. So Lewis says, like, okay, we... Um, uh, a lot of people... The... Um, you know, the the new sexual ethic that really got its solidification in the 1960s in the U.S., but had beginning to, to have its, its early days in the early 20th century. Um, um, this is what Hemingway's writing about with the British aristocracy in the 20s and 30s. Uh, uh, Lewis is saying, like, this new technology is meaning that the old sexual uh, laws and mores no longer need to be, or the argument goes that no longer need to be stringently followed because if the only reason why we said, um, you know, don't be promiscuous was because of a biological reason, you don't want little bastard children everywhere. Um, now that we have the way to keep children from happening, we don't need to keep following those old, um, those old rules that this new science and technology precludes us from having to follow the old moral ethic. Um, if the old moral ethic was only there to prevent a negative consequence, negative consequence in the yep. future. Now science can take care of those negative consequences of children. Therefore, we can let our sexual instincts run wild. That, that's kind of how Lewis portrays the, the, this, the beginning of the sexual revolution in, in his day. And we are now living in the, you know, the full-blown uh, world of, this, of the sexual revolution now. 
Um, but, Lu- but what Lewis is saying is that, that we are using technology to have control over that one generation of men can kind of have control over the next generation of men. And even the most of other powers of nature are that same way. So yep. like an airplane, uh, to quote, if I pay you to carry me, I'm not therefore myself a strong man. Any or all of the three things I have mentioned can be withheld from some men by other men, uh, that being airplane, the wireless, and the contraceptive. By those who sell, by those who allow the sale, or those who own the sources of production, or those who make the goods. What we call man's power is, in reality, a power possessed by some men, which they may or may not allow other men to profit by. Mm -hmm. So it's even contraceptive is my power over the next generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then Lewis has this sort of thought experiment where he says, if we have, let's say, um, uh, a snap, so if if we have a race or we have an ability uh, of this generation to have complete say over what the future generations are going to be, act, and, and, and exist like, um, then we are, can be, science and technology can put us in a very dangerous situation. So, you know, throughout the ages, the future generations have always had a say on what the subsequent generations are going to have. The fact that, I w- that we were all born into cities with plumbing, you know, was awesome. Um, And those future generations that had cities, that created cities with running water and indoor plumbing has meant that we have had a certain kind of life that we wouldn't have if that hadn't existed. So we, you know, those future generations had a tremendous amount of say over how our lives are going to go. Not fully, but a lot. But Lewis is saying that that is true of the, the, maybe the the, um, uh, environmental contexts that we're all born into. But what happens if we, if one generation can have the say over the actual makeup of the human person. Um, So he says, like, in reality, of course, if any one age really attains by eugenics and scientific education the power to make its descendants what it pleases, all men who live after it are the patients of that power. So um, if we had the ability to say this is what a human being should be what it ought to be and we have the the scientific power to do it well that deciding generation gets to, is what lewis called what does he call them the uh the conditioners the conditioners so there's this, he was still working with conditioning yeah so we, they would be this this sort of um this group of conditioners who before them humanity was was a certain way and after them humanity was the way that was that they had intended it to be um and, um, and so Lewis's fear is that um, if those conditioners, uh, uh, well, he, his idea is that the conditioners think that they need to improve upon humanity when in fact what they're doing is limiting humanity. Well, and on what basis are they going to make their choices, right? Maybe they think man ought to be happy and so they remove the gene in us that makes us sad or that makes us tend towards sadness or depression. Mm-hmm. The man that results from that procedure is going to be a hundred percent different from every other man that has ever lived. Mm-hmm. And he like, this comes from an argument where he says, if we talk about the power that each generation has, the most powerful generations were those at the beginning, right? The men of Greece, they set the Western canon and it's their philosophies that have influenced everything after them. Yep. Power will get less and less and less by generation, like maybe m- more technological power over nature and other men, but as, as far as like complete power over other men, the longer we go, the less power we will have mm-hmm. because eventually humanity will end. And so that last generation has only power over themselves. The generation before them has power over themselves and their children. And the, generation of, you know, Socrates had an an immense amount of power because it changed everything about everyone. But the moment we condition, the moment we make choices about what the next generation of man is going to be at the fundamental level, right? He is going to be better looking. He's going to be happier. He will never be Mm self-conscious. He will be athletic. He won't care about sorrow. He will be empathetic, right? All of, if we decide first, that means a complete change in who humans are. And second, that means that the people doing the deciding are those with the ultimate power, right? Up until now, God decided. After them, it'll be the conditioners. Or I think more realistically, it'll be their parents that choose the qualities they want their children to have. They don't want them to be depressed. They don't want them to be sad. They want them to be good looking. They want, to have, want them to have a certain eye color. They don't want baldness, right? If, if this is our option and this comes into the fore, baldness may be gone by 
a couple generations so, from now. So is the problem that people would make poor choices on the conditioning or that conditioning in and of itself? I guess my hangup is that like, um, uh, there are certain, you want your children to be certain ways and there are values and virtues you want passed on, passed on to them and trained in them. What's the, like, if you have someone who's making a good choice, like if you, if they're, 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 they're going to be courageous. We figure out a way that they're going to be the most courageous kid in the world. Like, why wouldn't you want that for your kid? So I think that, sorry, I didn't mean to use, no, go for it, you go wanna, for it. I, I think that there's a few problems there because you can have a kid and then teach him to be per- courageous. Mm-hmm. What you've had is a human. If you pull the genes of cowardice from a kid and only emphasize the genes of courage, what you are then working with is not a human in the traditional sense. It is a different thing. And it will be courageous and never cowardly. And if we go too far with this and we make every kid this way, we will have a complete generation of totally foolhardy men Mm. that are never scared for their lives. And we might end in thermonuclear war in a couple of years, right? Because they never have that element of cowardice. It's just, it is a really dangerous place. And the people making the choices Mm -hmm. are making choices based on the, the most fundamental base desires of man to be attractive to be loved, to, you know, have sex as often as possible coming along with the tradition, you know, the, the attractiveness thing Mm. to never be sad, but sadness is an important element in the human. It's built in there for a reason. And if none of us are ever sad, like, can you even imagine that a humanity with no sadness, what sort of monstrosities would that breed? Yeah. Uh, the idea being that human beings are a balance of all of these different things And if you introduce an imbalance, even the most well-intentioned imbalance, you are going to get behaviors and you are going to get some kind of um, outcomes that you may not have predicted. Um, So it's one analogy that I can think about this is, Thomas, if we decided to have a constitutional convention Mm -hmm. and we opened up, then we said, oh man, the constitution's real messed up in this one way. We need to change it. Well, the only way we can change this constitution is by getting together and having a constitutional convention and we opened it up. Would that be, do, do you foresee that being a successful or an unsuccessful no, thing? No, Why? Because there's so much disagreement as to what change should be made to the Constitution. Sure. So if we opened up the Constitution for radical surgery to change what it's going to be, it's going to come out and it may be this thing that never works anymore. Um, uh, uh, we are saying we want human beings to be better than they are right now, to be perfect. And we go in and then we may realize, oh, crap, actually we didn't realize the balances that we had that like having what we consider to be negative traits are in fact really beneficial. Um, sadness is an important part of humanity. Um, uh, if ugly, I'm never sad, I can never feel bad for hurting someone mm-hmm. else. Ugly people, even though everyone thinks in society that if you're ugly, you have a harder time existing. There is also a, a power that can come with being ugly. You know, like there's just, there's just these different ways that we, if we put our, uh, it, yeah, if, if we engineer human beings to be this, this thing, what we think they are, even the most well-intentioned, we are going to have something that is not a human being. We are going to have... Um, this what? is why it's called the abolition mm-hmm. of man, is because man, as we have known it for ages and ages and ages, is gone. Mm-hmm. And then, like, that day, the day that we implement gene editing for everyone, is zero day. Mm-hmm. Give it a couple of generations, and then whatever we have wrought, a man with... No fear, who is beautiful, who is courageous, who never feels sad and can jump a thousand miles and who's incredible and work for hours and hours. What is he going to make out of his kids? Like we think about what kind of edits we're going to make to ours. That man doesn't think like we do Mm. at all. He is a completely different animal. What is he going to do to his kids? Give it six generations. And what we are looking at is now so completely foreign to what humanity has been for millennia Mm -hmm. that it is unrecognizable Mm -hmm. um as teachers when you start a school or when you have an institution you say to yourself what do we want our students to look like when they leave what what is the veritas man and woman what is the type of person we want to have coming out of this institution not only what can they do but what have what sort of human being are they so we um, there's two, and then so if you have this idea of what that person is, there's kind of two ways about going about doing that. One is what I think is the classical way and, and sort of the, the old natural way of doing this is that you find teachers and instructors who are that and can 
um, form the students into that by the patterns and by their teaching and by the relationships that they build with the students. That the students will grow into being like the people that they have been taught by, both parents and teachers. So we've said many times in this podcast, the teacher is the curriculum. Um, the other way to do that is to say, here are, all the th- here are all the skills and characteristics that we want our student to be by the end of this. And then you think about these ways that you can uh, condition the student to be like that. Um, I always ask my students this question. Will we read Brave New World? And that's a book that's the, uh, sort of this question taken into extreme where they're conditioning their citizens to be a certain way. And I always, I always ask my students, what is the difference between what we do in a school and what is being conditioned in this book? Is there a difference between how I teach you and the things that I want you to be versus being conditioned uh, from like a laboratory kind of thing. In in uh, Brave New World, for those of you who mm-hmm. haven't read it, basically the kids are conditioned to be a certain way and do a certain thing from birth. Mm-hmm. They not only have their genes fiddled with, right? They they come out as maybe retarded growth because they th- like literally it, their growth has been slowed by al- alcohol solutions mm-hmm. in their mm-hmm. uh, as as their embryos, and then they come out and every night they listen to conditioning tapes as they sleep about how they should be, and then it changes fundamentally the way the way they function in society. So mm-hmm. their whole childhood is a one big exercise in conditioning. Mm-hmm. And we go back and forth in the conversation, and eventually the students get to the sort of conclusion that in the lit, in the second one, the Brave New World one, human beings are treated kind of like a machine that you can sort of change the parts, interchange these things, do different kinds of programming, and you'll get this different kind of output. But human beings aren't a machine. We're more, we are a creature. And it is, and we are not just like, controlled by inputs and outputs, but there are, there's environments that we need to exist in for happiness and this kind of thing. And of course, they've been learning this all year from me, so they know the answers by the end, <laughs> which is good. So Lewis is saying that like, okay, um, so... Um, so the, um, so the, the problem with it is that one treats people as human and the mm-hmm. other doesn't. One treats them as raw material to be, to be formed as the humans, as, as this conditioners sort of see fit. Um, let's see if I can find the quote that he says here. Yes, he says, either we are rational spirit obliged forever to obey the absolute values of the Tao, or else we are mere nature to be kneaded and cut into new shapes for the pleasure of masters who must, by hypothesis, have no motives but their own natural impulses. Only the Tao provides a common human law of action, which can overarch rulers and rule the like. A dramatic belief in objective value is necessary to the very idea of a rule which is not tyranny or an obedience which is not slavery. So Lewis says that if we sort of sever the human person from whatever this relationship that we have with the Tao. Um, because the, the conditioners pre- are deciding the new Tao, right. right? They get to decide how what is going to be important to the next race, how they are going to love, Mm -hmm. think, feel, what their values are going to be. They get to decide all of that. If if we separate from that, and in the Christian tradition, we say that that is a spiritual connection to God's law. Maybe people would say this is like consciousness and science just doesn't understand consciousness. Whatever it is, if we sever the human person so that the moral compass is no longer attuned or is no longer moving the soul and the feeling towards this objective law— then we will get something that is no longer human. Uh, the people who are conditioning this maybe think that it is going to be transhuman or better than human. Lewis is saying that what it is going to be it is going to be people that are more like beasts. They have to follow the instincts and the, quote, new law that has been programmed in them as opposed to um, this, this, this uh, um, relationship that we have with transcendent objective uh, law uh, Tao now. Um, uh, it is going to be the abolition of man. That's, that's where the title comes from. And so he says that, yeah, if, if men are in charge of determining the future of the rest of humanity based on their view as to what they think is important at that period of history, um, then we are going to cut people off from, from the rest of, of the Tao. Let's go back to the example that we used in the last podcast about Rome. So Rome valued Let's say just for, you know, for sake of argument, Rome valued honor and um, pragmatism, uh, maybe to the detriment of other beliefs or to other values. Well, if, if, the, 
If the men of Rome had the biological capability to turn human beings into what they thought human beings ought to be, the problem with society today is that no one cares about honor. All of our children should care about honor. Well, now we can genetically predispose our children to care about honor. And wouldn't that be great? We're going to have like, well, we will no longer have these problems of, of, you know, cowardice in the military. Oh, that'd be awesome if we could get rid of that. Well, you do that and you mess around on, uh, on one area and you don't know the implications that it's going to have. Or if it does sever the human soul to the concept of mercy and justice, uh, then you're going to have a maybe on paper honorable people, but you're going to have – it's not going to be a recognizable human. You're not, you're not you're, even be able to have conversations where you talk about dishonor because they're going to be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. All I know is – and then that might get weirdly overblown to the point where if someone doesn't open the door for someone else that they should open the door for or doesn't pay due deference and honor the persons they should honor, they are savagely murdered by everyone else in the room because mm-hmm. it is the one value that everyone has and is programmed into them to be unquestioned. So Lewis says he suspects that what's going to happen with these innovators and these conditioners is that they will come to hate the conditioned because they're like, oh my goodness, be rational. Why are you murdering that person because he didn't open the door for you? What are you, crazy? And the guy would be like, it is dishonorable for him to have slammed the door in that guy's face. Uh, you know, and then you have these And everyone else is like, yes, indeed, indeed, indeed it is. Indeed yeah. it is. And then, um, and then all of a sudden, like, um, yeah, you've got this, um, you've got what looks like a human being, uh, but you got a different hermit crab in that shell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's the gist of it. And, It's terrifying to me. It is terrifying. Does it scare you guys? Yeah, sure. Uh, So he was not specifically speaking to gene editing. Right. He Uh, was not. I mean, because he was mainly talking about the type of conditioning that he knew to exist, which was like, you know, saying things to you while you're sleeping subconsciously. And that that whole realm was real new Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1940s. Yeah. Um, But he is Red Huxley. And um, which Huxley wrote Brave New World in 1938. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, helicopters are in that book. Um, they didn't even exist yet. Anyway. Um, Smart dude. Yeah. yeah. So, ended, ended doing a lot of substances. Yes. <laughs> That's true. So <laughs> the, when he died too, right? So yeah, he kind, of, he kind of almost became one of the characters in his own books. Yeah. 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 Actually, Lewis and Huxley died on the same day. Uh, what? Uh, the same day that Kennedy was assassinated. All three of them died that day. Dang, yeah. what a day. I know. Um, anyway. Why isn't that day a holiday? Um, it'd be a really sad day, wouldn't yeah. it? It'd be sad, but yeah. I don't know. It feels like day to honor them. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it, it terrifies me. Um, well, what about it? Well, I guess at some level, some game theory comes into it, right? Like, we have nuclear power. We have nuclear bombs that can destroy the human race. And because we have nuclear bombs that can destroy the human race, that has kind of meant a certain, a new kind of international order has emerged that was very different than the 19th century where you could be sort of bloodthirsty and ruthless in a very different way. You can't be ultimately bloodthirsty and ruthless nowadays because there are nuclear bombs. It is unlikely that the U.S. will take over Russia because we are threatened with completely complete obliteration, right? We cannot have country to country warfare in the exact same way. So there could be an argument that says Um, if we, when we have the technology to completely rewrite human beings into the future, that also itself maybe works itself out to be a certain, a same kind of deterrent. My fear is like the accidental or the like clandestine lab. Um, or my fear is that sort of humanity sort of bifurcates that you have the people that are real into like the transhuman movement and they go all into this and they're super cool with having their kids be real different. And, and they say, yes, this is the next step in human evolution is like designed evolution. We using our own rationality. I want technology in my body. I want to use all these sorts of things. Let's go for it. And then you have what would be considered like traditionists or Luddites. The and normies. They say, the normies. Maybe called the normies probably. And the normies say, we're not doing this whatsoever. And then for religious reasons or or because they're classically educated or (laughs) whatever. (laughs) um, uh, And then they say, like, this is this is not humanity. And I could see that then you have you have these sort of almost like two races coexisting that look the same. But as time goes on, become very vastly, vastly different. Um, um, That to me seems like it would be a high probability. Because the like, problem, so be, then there would be conflict between those two 
different group. Sure. I mean, now we're getting, and then there's and all sorts prejudice. of prejudice. If you guys yeah. have seen the movie Gattaca, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, even see first there'll be prejudice against the people that do the modifications because they're the weirdos who are like, you see this coming up and again now. Uh, there was a guy in Australia who put his um, his bus chip. So you know, like they, they 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 get you get a little card and you put money on it, and every time you go on the bus, you swipe oh. your card. Well, he. Um, subdermally implanted that into his hand. So he put the chip into his hand so he never forgot it because he didn't want to leave, leave his bus pass at home. So he's got the chip in his hand. All he has to do is put the hand in front of the machine and it beeps. Um, and so he has it there. And I think he was sued or I think he oh. like got in trouble from the bus company because... You're supposed to have a card. You're supposed to have a card. But like, so... And he's saying like, they're, they, they hate me because I'm, because I'm different. Um, because I'm doing this different thing and I just want to be myself and live my own life and have my own... I want to be able to determine my own identity and existence as someone with a subdermally implanted bus chip. Um, and so, you know, you get the sen- I get the sense that for a while we will look at the people that do that with a certain amount of, of um, fear. Uh, and then eventually there'll be a critical mass where it shifts, where the normies are seen as like regressive and, mm-hmm. um, and the ones that are not playing ball um, and maybe they are. Maybe the normies are going to have uh, like real societal uh, headwinds against them because they can't run as fast or jump as high or compute as uh, 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 compute in their brains as quickly. Uh, but gosh darn it, they can love. <laughs> and, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so yes, that, uh, you you seem less concerned about this, maybe. Uh, I just think it straddles a weird line of um, you drew a connection between you Graham drew a connection between. Um, uh, teaching and conditioning. Mm-hmm. So I think there is a fine line between that. Um, so when you talk about the conditioner having to pick certain values that will be implanted in the next generation, so do teachers and parents um, make choices as to what is important and what they want to pass on. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know, since you all are bringing gene editing into the conversation, I, I wonder if there is still some case for health issues. Um, I don't know. Like, if we have technology to be able to remove diseases um, that were previously incurable, um, is that are we promoting human suffering on this podcast right now by saying actually you should never edit your genes? Like, yeah, if there is a, a, a cure, a solution that can be done by switching some of the coding, like I don't know. I'm I'm kind of with you there. I think there are certain physiological things if we can assure that they don't affect other genes that aren't, wouldn't be terrible to change, right? I, I don't think we're toying with the fundamental elements of humanity if we cure polio that way or if we cure cancer that way. Or is, is that getting to the concern uh, that Lewis has? Like, is any amount of tinkering the beginning of our slippery slope that then leads to robot children? Well, that's my concern is yeah. that we start with cancer and then we say, well, hey, baldness ain't that great let's get rid of that thing and then we say ah myopia let's let's fix our eyes too and then we're thinking well let's just make all of our cheekbones really pop (laughs) and then everybody gets full lips everyone gets big beautiful clear eyes Mm -hmm. and then you are to the limit on the physiological stuff and then i think it's a really slippery slope especially if we're talking disease where we take care of cancer and then we take care of imbalances in the brain chemical imbalances which is another way of saying depressed like sadness and depression if we if we take care of those things, we are changing the way that man interacts with his surroundings. Yeah, and I don't. I, has it ever been positively shown the causation there? Whether it is mm. the sadness that causes the imbalance or the imbalance that causes the sadness? I think it's only correlation. I don't know. I mean, we'd find out real quick, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean that that's my concern is that as soon as we pass into I want myself to be beautiful always, that becomes pro- a problem, and then the minute we get into our moral, philosophical, or natural reaction to the world is incredibly dangerous, yeah. right? I, I, can, I can teach a kid when it is appropriate to be sad, but I have not changed the way sadness happens in his brain right. as a teacher, right? I have not, I have maybe changed the way he might look at happiness or think about charity. I have not removed the concept of charity from him by removing the gene that would activate. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, a couple. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm most convinced by your argument that it's changing what it is to be human. And I think that mm-hmm. does matter. But I don't know. Like we take medicine. So if I say what it is to be human is the classical conception of there being a purpose to like a, a telos, an end of humanity. Well, 
Um, we didn't have medicine for a long time. So there's a certain amount of suffering. There's a shorter lifespan that is more classically consistent, but I don't think anyone here would be like, <laughs> well, we should live shorter lives yeah. I, or maybe you would. I, I, I don't think you would. Does that make like, yeah, it does. I mean, so as Christians, we believe that we are body, soul composites, that we have bodies and they have physical, they're made of physical stuff, but someplace, somewhere, we don't know how the spiritual made in God's imageness of our human person interacts and is in the body. That they Did you not- know that the ancients believed that the mind was glued to the body <laughs> through like blood smoke? <laughs> Sure. It's awesome. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? crazy? It was it was a it was a vapor put off yeah. by the blood that kind of bound the mind. Bound the, to the, mind that, was the this, that was the spirit. Isn't so, that kind of neat? Yeah. Oh so, man, they had some fun ideas. So as Christians, if we think that like, you know, our bodies are created and designed in a way to house a spiritual thing, the soul that is made in God's image that has rationality and consciousness and this kind of thing, then we have then we don't really know how that plays itself out physically. But the argument is, if we start tinkering around and messing around with the body, what happens if we, like, sever that link? Oh. And then, but then the other argument is, no, human beings are just matter. We are just, and consciousness is just something that has, that is material. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you change that, it's not a good or a bad thing, it's just a different thing. And I think that would be the line where... um, That's the philosophical line where, where, where the line in the sand between go for it and don't go for it is like you get to that place where you accidentally snip the, the important wire. I don't know. That's maybe a, even a, a poor materialistic way to describe it. Um, well, the you're, you're fixing your car and you accidentally cut the uh, fuel lines, mm-hmm. yeah. right? You're thinking you're just going to get a little more compression in that old yeah. carburetor and, uh, or whatever. Car and, and functioning fuel happening. lines, and functioning yeah. fuel <laughs> lines is just like your own opinion as to what a healthy car is. Right, and my opinion of what a healthy car is is like an unfunctioning fuel line. Well, I'm going to have my car that like I don't need a functioning fuel line because I'm going to directly, constantly be adding fuel into the car <laughs> manually as I drive, and that's just a different way of driving. You know, so it's just like yeah. it's that kind of that kind of idea um, that um, the human beings can be optimized and changed. But Lewis's argument is that those human beings are going to be bound and kind of slaves to the whims of the generation before them, yeah. unlike any other generation has been slaves to the generations before them. Um, yes, we have determined aspects of our lives because of the generations that came before us. The good and the ill of what our forefathers have done have created a lot of the context. But we also have a humanity that can, can transcend those goods and those bad things. But Lewis is saying that that doesn't have to be the case moving forward. We could screw it up so badly that we create something that is not a human being. Yeah. Um, and then, and then this, the generation that does the gene editing is the last mm-hmm. human generation, which is terrifying. It's really scary. It is. I hadn't thought of it. Graham, when you were making your statement about body, soul composite, I thought you were going to take it in a direction of, well, if gene editing is only changing the body, then humans would still have souls. Therefore it kind of doesn't matter what, uh, whatever the body and soul are more closely linked than I'm expressing right now. But almost it would matter less because there would still be soul. Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're hard dualists and we think like the soul is just trapped in the body and they have no intercourse, then maybe that's, an, maybe that's a theological argument for it. But I don't think that can be borne out. Like bodies are important yes. in Christian yeah, tradition. Yep. Um, and one other thing was we, ta- we were talking about the idea be- behind teaching and indoctrination or conditioning and yeah. teaching. And part of me thinks the reason why students believe something is incredibly important. So if someone said to me, hey, Donaldson, you could have your kids all want to die for your nation, for their nation. Think that that is a good thing. I'm going to use that as the example. Um, I still, part of me thinks, or a huge part of me, or no, not even part of me. I think that the way that those students come to that conclusion is incredibly important. If someone said, push a button and, or they are willing to die for their nation because they all believe that the military and uh, American foreign policy is always correct and they should, and, and they are willing to die for that. I would be more uncomfortable with that. Well, are some, you about to criticize no, 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 American no, foreign policy? No, what foreign I'm saying, policy? no, no, my point is, I am. <laughs> no, my awesome. point is that. Um, the way a, a someone comes to a conclusion about the Tao is an incredibly important thing. So um, um, it is good and noble to die for right causes, I think, is, is the, the conclusion that I would want students and myself to hold. Um, 
unquestionably dying because an, an authority that you live under tells you to is not. Um, but if someone said, we can have your student, we can, maybe I'm, I've, I've put myself into a bad example. Um, if someone said, we could push a button and all your students would be willing to do, would we be willing to die for their country? Um, without reasoning. Without reasoning, I would say no. Even though maybe if we had a war and those students did go and they did die and it did work out well, someone could say, look, the results, we got what we wanted. Right. I would say, yes, but we twisted their arms and we, and we, and, and we poisoned their minds and we, prop, and we propagandized them into doing it. It makes you a tyrant and yes. them slaves. Whereas yeah. if someone said, they went, they die for their country and they did it with glowing hearts and with, you know, they, they, because they, they love their nation and they wanted to keep their family safe. And it was in fact a noble cause. Then I would say we need to raise statues and honor that generation because what they did so that we can live free is important. They did it free. I think, I think the difference here is agency, yes. right? They chose with agency and in the classroom, mm -hmm. right? They're young and impressionable, but they, at some point they have agency. Mm -hmm. If we program this in with genes, their agency is lost. Yes. Um, but we also don't just sort of say, so figure it out for yourself. No, we right. as teachers say it is meat, it is meat and right. It is, it is good and right for one to die for a noble cause. And then show them why. And then show them why. And so that when a noble cause presents themselves and they have the opportunity to do it, um, then they are doing it as, as, you know, like gallant noble citizens, as opposed to like, we've created unthinking fodder for cannons. And I, and I mean, yes, it is an uncomfortable situ thing to think about, but like, um, I think in the modern world, we really think about ends a lot more than means, or we really think about results a lot more than process. Or motive. Or motive. Um, I, I think this is from what Lewis talks about in chapter two, that we've lost a way to talk about these things morally. And so we can agree on outcomes. We can mm -hmm. agree that winning wars are it's better good. than losing mm -hmm. wars, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so the utilitarianism kind of rises up as the alternative to a virtue ethic, which is probably more classical. Uh, yeah. yeah. Look, I got an A on this paper. Well, no, you didn't. You, didn't you downloaded it. it. Like, right. you, you right. stole it from somebody else. Yeah. You did not get an A. Um, or, look, I got an A on this test, and I didn't even have to study. Yeah. It's like, all right, well, that may worked out for you this time, but that is not the virtue that we need to have you exist by because working in because you're going to come to a point where you need to work and learn and mm -hmm. if you think that that the good results come from lack of effort then when effort is required of you you're going to crumble and that is and then as a weak we are putting a weak person into the world that thinks that that's the way it works mm -hmm. so yeah the the process the virtue ethic is uh, i i wouldn't if someone said we could create students that are perfect citizens just by pushing this button or tinkering with their genes uh i would you know I, I think that's monstrous yeah, I think the other danger is that, I mean, this is probably just me not fully understanding science, which happens on occasion, but... <laughs> Real very rarely, though, Hanover. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, erudite. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's incredibly dangerous to tinker with a machine that we are only beginning to understand. We have mapped the human g genome. That means we know where everything is. Mm -hmm. We I don't saw necessarily know how it all interacts with itself, and it's, a, and it's an incredibly complex machine, mm -hmm. and... I don't know that we can be sure that changing one gene doesn't mm -hmm. flip on have a, flip a, off a bunch effect. of other genes. And it's like beginning to be like, yes, I have found all the parts of the computer chip. Now let me just tinker with these <laughs> exactly. couple wires mm -hmm. and See everything happens. will go awesome. You know? uh, I, was, I saw a headline. That's probably just a now thing and yeah. later we'll figure it out. But still, I mean, that's, if I, if I turn it like, okay, let's get rid of my myopia and then all of a sudden, like, their stomachs are gone. And I'm like, oh, well. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Well, yeah. Dang. Um, I, I just, I saw a headline as we were coming in. I was on Twitter and I saw a headline. And the headline was like, scientists realize they know a whole lot less about parrots than they thought they did. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. So good. I was like, oh, man, if that's true about parrots, parrots what's that yeah. true about us? Yeah, like, I don't want them, like, parrots can, like, you know, talk. And the parrot leadership is like, they're on to us. <laughs> Right, like, um, there's an arrogance that we know a lot more than we do, and, and hide the crackers, gentlemen. And, and if we get to that point where we, yeah, the idea that there is a zero hour, that there's this like turning point where we've we've sort of gone too far in our quote conquest of nature, where it turns out, and this is how Lewis phrases it, turns out that all the conquest, the things that we thought we were. Um, conquering nature were in fact strategic retreats by nature, and once we 
Once we turn those tools on our own bodies and our own souls, uh, we become mere beasts and nature has conquered us. Mm. Um, that's that's kind of the, the way that Lewis um, yeah. sort of talks about this. And yes, it is something that I, I, um, I think about, especially when, um, yeah, um, when we really care about results as, a, as opposed to process. Uh, oh, we really need to eradicate crime in this region. Well, we can do that by the human ways of elevating the soul to, to you know, uh, love the brotherhood of man. That takes too long. Or we can just, like, tinker with their genes. Mm -hmm. Or the more monstrous things, um, we can just maybe figure out a way that, that this, you know, area of society doesn't reproduce. Yeah. And that's, that's happened in human history. Yikes. Mm -hmm. that, that is the history of eugenics, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's terrifying. Okay, I, I'm terrified now. You won. Okay. So, I don't, this is our last podcast on, on this the Abolition of Man. Yeah. Man. Uh, are you guys finished? I don't want to... Yep, that's all I've... Uh, that, that's, that is... I think we've done justice to the three chapters. Yeah. So, let's sort of bring it all together. Yeah. If we could summarize the book, he essentially says education is pulling, pulling at the tau in mm -hmm. students, and the tau is not to be tinkered with, really, or at least not to be completely debunked. And that the moment we go so far in science as to destroy the Tao in the next generation, we are obliterating humanity. Mm -hmm. all, the, all of these concepts are foundational for the way that I teach. I don't mm -hmm. know if they are no, for so, you guys. Totally. But a after fully reading and understanding this book, I think all the time about being careful not to completely debunk values that are in books and to present good passages that evoke the values that I want kids to think about. I think about the Tao and about how I can stand firm on certain values and then discuss them with students. Like it, it's, it's affects my life and the way that I live out with students. And I encourage you as an audience, go read it. C.S. Lewis is Seriously. accessible. It took me two or three times through to fully understand everything he was saying, read it with a pen, but it is, it is worth your time. Mm -hmm. It's worth mine. And I, it's one of those books that I, feel like I need to come back to every single year just to sort of realign myself. Um, to me, when I read it again, and I, I, the way I sort of distill it down into a guiding principle for teaching is my students are creatures made by God in God's image. They have a nature. They have a human nature. They have a way that they have been made that there's like an environment and a mode of being and a mode of thinking and a mode of belief that will make them satisfied, good, noble, and happy. And the same is true for me. And they are not raw material to put into my, whatever sort of um, uh, uh, ideology I want them to have. Like, I'm not trying to, like, have them all leave good little Republicans or whatever, right? Um, but there is a human, that's why it's called the humanities. We are trying to, um, I, I am trying to elevate them into being more fully human and I want that for myself. Yeah. Um, and when I read passages where I see a noble action of a character doing something and I'm self-reflective and I say, I wish that if I was in that situation, I would do the same thing because what they did was right and say that to the students and be honest and say, this action is noble and it, that is, it is a, it is a type of action that is worth praising and I wish I was like that. Or um, in, um, I, this comes up a lot in, and so the one that I use is in 10th grade, we do uh, Paradise Lost. And Adam does not, Adam has the opportunity to um, take the hit for Eve. Eve was tricked and Adam has the opportunity to go to God and say, don't blame her, blame me. And he doesn't do it and is punished for it. Um, and then God says, I'm going to do it anyway, and he sends Jesus. And so I always tell my children, uh, I always tell my students, like, if if I'm ever in that situation that Adam was in, where I can I can take the blame on someone who doesn't who who doesn't take the blame, like that is a what Christ did is a noble action that we should emulate, yeah. um, as opposed to like, um, you know, God thinks you're great and gave you a get out of hell free card. Like it's different. That's a different way of. Of, of portraying the truth of what the, the, the gospel and what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's, that's how I practically think about it is that they are creatures made uh, for 
a telos made for a purpose. And so basically, just, you mm-hmm. march beside them, you exactly. don't chain them to mm-hmm. a wagon, and then send them off down a road you'd rather not walk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I don't want to die for my country. Like, go for it. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> and you have no choice. Bye. Yeah, 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 yeah. And rather than mm-hmm. walking the road with them, trying to be noble mm-hmm. yourself. And like, you'll there, get an A. There's a, there's a big difference there. Here's, you'll get an A if you write me an essay telling me why you'll die for your country. Mm-hmm. And you'll fail if you don't. Like, that's bad. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a quote? I see you holding your commonplace. Oh, that's that's the last thing. Are we there? Or did we get oh. anything wrong? Uh, can I can I read the last sentence? You or the last section of Abolition mm-hmm. of Man? Because yes, I think it's really, do. really good. Um, you cannot go on seeing through things forever. I think that AJ has referenced this idea a lot. Yeah. And I find this, it's brilliant. I really uh, have like one note. <laughs> <laughs> and it's I'm a one trick pony. Uh, you cannot go on seeing through things forever. The whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it. It is good that the window should be transparent. Uh, it's good. Oh man. Sorry. It is good that the window should be transparent because the street or garden beyond it is opaque. How, if you saw through the garden too, it is no use trying to see through first principles. If you see through everything, then everything is transparent. But a wholly transparent world is an invisible world. To see through all things is the same as not to see. And that, I just and to think that he was writing this just in the fifties, did y'all fifty sixties, whenever it was, and then forty three, I think. I think it was the middle of the war. Oh, cool. uh, oh yeah, sorry, we did. We talked mm-hmm. about that before. Uh, and so then um, to see what is kind of flowed out of that seventy years later, um, things have not gotten better from this, right? Like the ideas he is he is presenting, um, I think have just gotten um, worse. Yeah, so definitely worth a read. Man, he's such a good writer. Yes, can we just take a minute? Yeah, C.S. Lewis is fantastic at the practice of writing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. The quote I have is from a book called Loris. If anybody has ever read it, it's it's a pretty good one. It's about a guy that lives in the time of the plague. It's a really interesting read. I think it's translated from Russian. And he'll toss people in there who speak in modern vernacular, and it's, cool. it's real. It's real curious, but it jumps around. There's some. Uh, there's periods of the book that are set in like communist Russia, 1900s, yeah. looking back, like at this church, and they're like, "I wonder who existed in this church." And then the story goes back to the guy who's mm-hmm. existed in that church. It's fun. It's yeah, a great, it's read. great book. And I, I thought this was pertinent if you think of this as regarding the conditioners and the the people doing the gene editing, rather than the thing it's talking about. This is kind of, I don't know. For what you have tamed, you become responsible forever, Christopher said, stroking the wolf. Hmm. Yep. It's good. Good. All right. Um, anything else? Any stuff we got wrong? We are perfect. And uh, do you want to comment on Canadian novels? Oh. Right. Um, <laughs> you can say yeah, no. No. No, I stand by my statement. Okay. No, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> no, my statement was that's a little awesome. heavy-handed in saying that all Canadian novels are sort of like sad and depressing. Um, but Anne Green Gables is not sad. And uh, I still think Margaret Atwood is a little sad and depressing. Um, but there are, yes, just like any other culture, there is a vast um, uh, array of different kinds of, of Canadian novels out there. My guess is the ones that were selected for Canadian public school were sad and depressing. And that's, that's what <laughs> yeah, I was... Good. They just um, want to keep you guys down. Mm-hmm. The English Patient, Michael and Dante, that is a great novel. Yeah. Uh, so I, I retract my statement. I humbly retract it. <laughs> good. Awesome. All right. Anything else to say at the end? Uh, uh, I don't think cool. so. Cool. At this point, we are crushing in the school year and we're just trucking along. So Just wrapped up the first week. Isn't that right? First was week it? Mm-hmm. Did we just finish the first week of school? As we record this, when yeah. you listen to this, we'll probably be third weekend, yeah. I think. Um, so yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, we are classical stuff at veritasacademy.net. If you want to tweet at us, we are at classical stuff at C L S S C A L stuff. We're online at classical stuff.net and you can find pictures of us there. You can find paintings to go with every episode. It's true. Is it still Graham? Is your bad picture still I out there? Know. I haven't checked. My guess is yes. I, indeed it is. Good. So everyone should go and admire Graham's very funny face mm-hmm. on classical stuff.net. Womp, womp. And with that, I think we are done. This has been Graham, Thomas and AJ signing off. Signing off. Bye. Ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do-ba-do